Well, what's up, people? Good to see you all. Hey, uh, so, so I'll be honest. Uh, sometimes I come across stories that are just a little too good not to share, uh, but also sometimes I come across stories that are a little too weird not to share. Uh, this story I'm about to share falls into the weird category, but, but get this. So apparently, I don't know how long ago, uh, probably a while ago, uh, but, but apparently there's something like 20 million cats and dogs living in New York City. Now, now, maybe that's not shocking because, you know, the city's big and, and yeah, I guess that kind of makes sense. But, but at least for me, one of the things I didn't think about, when you have 20 million cats and dogs living in a city, uh, what happens when they die? Like, where do they go? You can't exactly bury them in your backyard like Justin Dirks does in good old Missouri, right? It's the concrete jungle. What, what happens? What happens When these pets die, 20 million cats and dogs, what happens when they die? Well, of course, the city realizes, hey, we've got a big problem here. And so they come up with a plan, a plan that you would expect. They, they, for a fee, for a service, or or for a fee, they'll do a service for you. They'll come and, and collect your pet, your animal, and they'll dispose of it. They'll give it the proper burial that, that it deserves, right? The only catch was it's expensive. It's not cheap for the city to have to come and find you, your door, your home, your apartment, whatever it is, and, and take your animal and get rid of it. And so, so a woman living in the city says, you know, I think I can come up with something better. I think I got a better idea. I think I can do the same thing. I think I can provide the same service, but I think I can cut the cost in half. And so she puts an ad out. She, she puts an ad and says, hey, look, uh, this is what I'll do. I'll, I'll take care of your pet. I'll give it the burial it deserves. I'll come and get it. I'll show empathy and care and all these things. And, and this is a really hard process for you. I get it. And I'll, 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 I'll handle all the dirty work. And so she puts this ad out. And as you would expect, people call. It's cheaper. It's half of what the city charges. Things die and things have to be disposed of. And so, so people call. When they do... I told you it gets, it's going to get a little weird, right? So, so when they start calling her, what she does is she goes to the local Goodwill, the local Salvation Army, and she takes a few bucks, 2 or $3, it's all it costs, and she buys, you know, you've seen them, the nice old suitcases, right, like your grandparents had. And she goes to the home. Now, I don't think she walks into the house with this old dungy, like, you know, suitcase, because that would probably be a little off-putting, but, but she's got the suitcase, and she takes the pet. She takes the animal, and she says, okay, here's, here's I'm going to get rid of it, I'm going to bury it, uh, take care of it. I don't know what she said. Uh, but they give the money, and she goes off on her way, and, and she puts the animal in the suitcase, Now, that's weird, right? We can admit that's kind of weird. It gets weirder because after she puts the animal in the suitcase, wherever that is, she goes on a ride. Where? The subway. Why? Well, because apparently there are thieves on the subway. It's weird, right? So she takes a ride with this dead animal in a suitcase that she got at a Goodwill store. She takes a ride on the subway where thieves are, and she gets on that subway she puts that suitcase down, and she goes on a little walk about the, the car, the subway car. And she <laughs> pretends like she forgot about her suitcase, and she says more often than not, a thief would come and grab that suitcase. And you can just imagine, stop, thief, come back, right, as this thief is getting away with this dead pet in a suitcase that she got at Goodwill. Now, here's a question. What kind of person comes up with this idea? Like, seri- like, who comes up with the idea that I'm going to undercut the city by buying a used suitcase, stuffing an animal in it, taking it on a subway, hoping that a thief will come along and steal it? That's weird. Now, now also, at the same time, imagine, imagine the look on those thieves' face, right? Imagine, they, they, they go through all this work, and, and they, they do the thing. They steal the suitcase, right? They think they've got this stuff, and they get wherever thieves go, and they, you know, take their bounty or whatever it is, and, and they, they're getting ready to open it and see what they got, and they, dead cat. <laughs> it's messed up. Now, now, I told you I like a good story, and I like a good, good weird story, but, but I'm not sharing it just because I think that's weird, and that was the most interesting part of my day. I'm sharing it uh, because as weird as it sounds, I get that it's weird, it's bizarre. As weird as it sounds, I started thinking about this story probably a little too much, but I started thinking, you know, I'm a lot like those thieves. I think I'm a lot, I, I, I have something in common with those thieves, and to be honest, I think you do too. 
And I think that thing that we have in common is that we too spend a lot of time chasing things. We spend a lot of time going after things that we think we want, things that we think we need, things that we think will make us happy. And sometimes we actually get that thing, right? And, and, and whatever that thing is, we, we grab it, we snatch it, we, we get a hold of it, and, and we get wherever we're going, and we open up that suitcase, except it's not what we thought it was. It's not what we wanted at all. This whole thing, this, this whole process of getting this thing that I want, it's not exactly what I expected it to be. It didn't go the way that I thought it would. It's not how I wanted it to turn out. You ever been there? You ever had that experience? You're, you're chasing something, something that you think will make you happy, but, but maybe you get it, and as it turns out, it didn't really make you happy at all. You thought that it would bring some sort of satisfaction. You thought that it would bring some sort of comfort and, and joy, and, and maybe it did temporarily, but it didn't last. It wasn't what you thought it was. Maybe you're sitting there, and, and, and that's your experience right now. There's something in your life that, that you're chasing, that, that you're hoping to get, that you're running after, that you're wanting to, to grab. Maybe a relationship. Maybe a grade. Maybe a job. Maybe a friend's status. Maybe a, I don't know, an influencer. I, I don't know. What, what is it for you? What are you chasing? What is that thing that you think will make you happy, that thing that you think you want? See, we're all doing it. Every single one of us here is doing it. You're not alone if that's you right now because we're all doing it. Blaise Pascal, he was a, uh, I've talked a little bit about him before. He was like, a, I, don't, I don't know, 17th century mathematician, philosopher. Uh, he, he says something that I think is really insightful. He says this. He says, all men, I think you would add women, all human beings seek happiness. This is without exception. Whatever different means they employ, they all tend to this end. The cause of some going to war and of others avoiding it is the same desire in both and tended with different views. The will never takes the least step put to this object. This, this pursuit of happiness, is the motive of every action of every man, even of those who hang themselves. You see what he's saying? See, if he's right, and I think he is, what he's saying is that everything you and I do is motivated by happiness. Everything that you and I do is motivated by what we think will make us happy. All of our actions, all of our choices, ultimately motivated by, by what we think is going to bring this lasting sense of happiness, this, this lasting sense uh, of uh, flourishing in, in the good life, this, this lasting joy and satisfaction that we all want. That's, that's what you want, right? That's, that's what I want. That's what our culture tells us we need. And here's the thing. Jesus wants that for you. You see, I know we talk a lot about happy. I talk a lot. I think I've talked about happiness every time this semester. Maybe you're getting tired. We do it because Jesus does it. And you know what? Jesus wants you to be happy. Jesus wants you to be happy. But the thing is, Jesus' definition for what's going to make you happy, Jesus' definition of, of what happiness really is and, and how we get it, a lot of times it's different than ours. A lot of times it's different than the culture's message that, that is around us, that's screaming at us, that's shouting at us, that's wanting our attention. If you weren't here last week and, and didn't get a chance to watch the service on YouTube or, or listen to the talk on, on our podcast, Veritas Mizzou, uh, we started a new Tuesday night series. We're going through a section of Matthew's Gospel uh, known as the Beatitudes. The, the word beatitude, if you were here, you remember, it, it, it just means blessing. It's from this Latin word that means blessing. And, and for those of you who were here, you, you probably remember that, that when we get to the Beatitudes, this section of Matthew's gospel, Jesus is, is early in his public ministry, right? And what he's doing, particularly in these verses, at, at this point in his ministry, he's teaching his disciples. He's, he's teaching his followers about what? About himself and, and what it's like to be in his kingdom. And, and ultimately, 
what it looks like to experience this real and lasting happiness that God had created them for. That real and lasting happiness that that God created them for and God created you for and me for. But catch this, I didn't say this last week, catch this, Jesus' ministry, this, these teachings, they don't, they don't come from a vacuum, right? No, 700 years prior to, to these verses in, in Matthew chapter 5, the Old Testament prophet Isaiah, he, he anticipated, he, he predicted a time, he prophesied a time that, that God's suffering servant, that was how he just, God's suffering servant would minister to God's people. How? This is, this is what we see, Isaiah 61 Picking up in verse 1, this, this suffering servant says, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from darkness for the prisoners, to, pro- to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. 700 years before Jesus. Now fast forward to the time of Jesus. Jesus walks into a synagogue, different gospel, gospel of Luke. He walks into a Jewish synagogue, as was his custom, and and he stands up and he begins teaching. Someone handed him a scroll, and and then he goes to a certain set of scripture verses, and, and he begins teaching. You know what he started reading? Luke 4, picking up in 18. The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim Good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened to him. He began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. You catch what he said there? Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. See, Isaiah anticipated Jesus that he came to fulfill it. Fulfill what? He came to proclaim good news. He came to bind up the brokenhearted, proclaim freedom for captives, release prisoners from darkness, comfort, he says, all who mourn. Now, I'm saying all this because I want us to see that Isaiah's prophecy, 700 years before the time of Jesus, anticipated this very moment. That prophecy, it forms the backdrop for what we read in Matthew 5 when we get to the Beatitudes. And in particular, it forms the backdrop of the Beatitude we read tonight. Matthew 5, verse 4, we saw it earlier. Blessed, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Now, it's kind of an odd statement, isn't it? I mean, think about that for a second. Blessed are those who mourn. Happy, we might say, are those who are not happy. Flourishing are those who are sad. Blessed are the, those who mourn. It's a, it's a paradox. It's upside down. It, it doesn't quite make sense. It, it seems contradictory. Blessed are those who mourn. Mourn what? Anything? Everything? Specific things? What's Jesus talking? When he says blessed are those who mourn, what's he talking about? Now, I want us to remember. I'm going to keep repeating this. Remember, these beatitudes, these blessings, remember what they are. They, they aren't what? They're not pithy virtue statements that you and I are striving to attain. That's not what they are. No, they're, they're kingdom statements. These beatitudes, they're, they're kingdom statements meant to do what? They're, they're meant to shape who you and I are in light of who the king is. These beatitudes, these blessings, they're meant to to shape Jesus' followers in light of who he is. They're meant to shape you and me in light of him. And so these verses, this, Jesus says, this is what it's like to live inside my kingdom, his kingdom, where you and I, where his followers, his people will be most happy, most blessed, flourish as God intended them to flourish. Flourish as God wants you to flourish. And so that's why Jesus, you know, last week, that's why Jesus starts the Beatitudes with with blessed are those who are poor in spirit. What does poor in spirit mean? Remember, it it means blessed are those who who see their sin, who who see their their spiritual bankruptcy before God. And, And more importantly, they see their need for Jesus. 
And when they do, for theirs, Jesus says, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. But, but he takes it a step further tonight. He takes it a step. See, these beatitudes, they're connected. They're not individual statements meant to be spliced up and, you know, cherry pick here and cherry pick there. No, they're, they're, they're connected. And so Jesus, he takes that first beatitude and he takes it a step further tonight when he says, blessed are those who mourn. Mourn what? Sin. Blessed are those who mourn sin. See, what Jesus is saying when he, when he follows blessed are the poor in spirit with blessed are those who mourn is that it's not enough simply to see our sin. It's not enough for you and I to just recognize it, to admit it, to say, yeah, you know what, I'm a sinner, you're a sinner, we're all sinners. Of course that's true. And of course we need to admit that, but, but that's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying here, he's saying blessed, happy, flourishing are those who are saddened by their sin. Happy are you when you lament your sin, when you mourn over it. See, Jesus is saying, happy are you when sin grieves you, when sin brings sorrow. Why? Why why mourn? Why lament? Why grieve sin? Well, Because sin's not the way that God intended things to be, right? It's not the way it's supposed to be. It's not what God intends. It's not what God wants. And so Jesus says to his earliest followers, he's saying to you and me, he's saying to us, he says, blessed will you be when you mourn, grieve, lament over your sin. But, big but, right, not all mourning is created equal. In other words, there are right and wrong ways that you and I can mourn over our sin. What what do I mean? Let me show you. New Testament. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Let me, let me set it up for a second before we get to the verses. Uh, uh, Paul has just rebuked the Corinthian church, these Christians in the Corinthian church. He's just rebuked them for, for this certain set of sins that, that they'd been struggling with. And, and what he says is, is, is that at first, he says, I kind of regret it. He said, I, I had to say some really hard things to you. I, I had to say some strong words. You're, 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 you're doing some serious sins. I kind of regretted it. It hurt the relationship. It, I, man, I didn't really want to do that. So, so just as a sidebar, people, we don't like rebuking each other for sin. It's not an easy thing to do. We, we get that when we say hard things to each other, that, that sometimes it rocks the boat. Sometimes it hurts the relationship. And, and we don't like that. If you think that I enjoy making people feel bad about it, that's not, that's not it. And that's what Paul says, too. He says, I kind of regretted it at first. I know that it hurt our relationship. I I love you. I care about you. I grieve that. But then he says this. This is is where you get to verse verse 9. He said, yet now I'm happy. At At first I regretted it, yet now I'm happy. Why? Not because you were made to feel sorry, but because your sorrow led you to repentance. For you became sorrowful as God intended, and so were not harmed in any way by us. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow, worldly sorrow, it brings death. See, what Paul knows is that every human being feels sorrow. All of us, at some point in our life, experience grief. But, but at the same time, Paul says that not all sorrow, not all mourning, not all grief, especially when it comes to sin, not all grief and mourning and lamenting is the same. There's, there's worldly sorrow, and then there's godly sorrow. What's the difference? What's the difference between worldly sorrow and godly sorrow? Well, according to Paul... One leads to life, the other leads to death. According to Paul, one leads to repentance, and the other, other it leads to regret. One leads to heart change, one hardens our hearts. It it, it hardens us. See, Paul knows that that we all feel sorry. We all feel guilty at times, but, but he knows that it's possible to feel sorry for the wrong reasons. It's possible that you and I feel sorry, you and I grieve, you and I mourn, you and I lament sin for the wrong reasons. What does that look like? That's just a few examples. We, we feel bad. We feel bad when that person that we are gossiping about finds out what we said. 
We feel bad. We, we, we thought we were having a private conversation. We are talking about them. We, we didn't expect for them to find out, and, and they did. And gosh, now we just feel kind of crappy. Maybe we, we regret going out, getting drunk, and, and blowing the exam the next day, or blowing off the group project that we have, or, or whatever our school. Re- Sometimes we're sorry we're not sorry, right? See, worldly sorrow, it's, it's an expression of grief. It's, it's this expression of regret when we lose something that's important to us. Things like possessions, things like opportunities, things like status, the opinions of others. We're sad because of the circumstances that our choices bring into our lives. We're, we're sad because we, we feel embarrassed. We're sad because we regret what we did that makes other people think less of us because we all care what other people think of us. And so we feel bad, but really, mostly, it's that we regret getting caught. We feel bad, but sometimes it's, it's more, we feel bad because I just made life harder for myself. I, I regret doing that thing because now you think less of me, and I really care what you think about. See, you ever been there? <laughs> Have you ever... Has that ever described you? You feel bad just because you got caught. Feel bad because now how people think about you. Feel bad because you're embarrassed over what you've done. I for sure have. Too many times. Too many times. See, but what, what, what I'm trying to say is that simply regretting the consequences of our sin, that's not godly sorrow. That's not godly sorrow. It's not godly grief. It's not the kind of mourning that Jesus says will will bless us. It's not the kind of mourning that Jesus is talking about when he says blessed are those who mourn. He's not talking about worldly grief, worldly sorrow. No, because as Paul says, that's the kind of mourning that leads to death. Now, of course, he's, he's talking spiritually speaking, right? Worldly sorrow, it leads to death, spiritually speaking. Why? Because it shifts the focus from God to us. It blinds us from the the consequences that that our sin brings. It it blinds us from from sin's offensiveness to God. It, It makes us care more about our present circumstances than we care about our relationship with God. And so worldly sorrow, it's it's, it's kind of like, um, it's kind of like treating the symptoms instead of the disease, right? Focusing on the the outside instead of the inside, the the external instead of the internal. When we do that, when when we focus on the symptoms and not the disease, when we focus on the outside, not the root, what happens? We don't really change, do we? When we just focus on the external circumstances of our lives, well, we don't actually change. We don't actually grow. We don't really feel sorrow about sin the way that God wants us to feel sorrow. That's worldly grief. That's worldly sorrow. And Paul says that it leads to death. But godly grief, godly mourning, godly sorrow is completely different. Instead of self-pity and and anger and and pride, instead of running and hiding and and wallowing, sometimes we wallow in our sin, right? Instead of blame shifting and and finger pointing or sometimes just flat out denying sin, no, uh, when we have godly sorrow, it means that we admit our sin. It means we admit it. We see it. We admit it. But not only that, we, we mourn over it. We lament it. Ultimately, we repent. That's, it's kind of a Christianese word, right? We repent. What it really means is that we just hate our sin more and more. When, when you see your sin so clearly, when you have godly grief, godly mourning over sin, you just hate it. You hate it more and more. And the more you hate your sin, the more you run from it. And it's not just running from sin, it's not just running from something, it's running to someone, and that to someone is running to Jesus. Why? Because when we run to Jesus because of our sin, we find free grace and love and mercy and forgiveness. That's what Jesus offers. That's why we turn from sin and run to him. And I think it's why David, you know the story of David and Bathsheba in the Old Testament, even if you didn't grow up with the Bible, if you read your Bible, you know the story of David and Bathsheba. It's why David, after committing these 
terrible sins, I say sins, terrible atrocities toward Bathsheba and her husband Uriah after he's confronted with what he's done and he finally gets it, finally sees the sin that the sins that he's done. This is, this is what he says, Psalm 51, 1 and 2. David says, have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgression, wash away all my iniquity, cleanse me from my sin. Cleanse me, God, wash me, have mercy on me. According to your compassion, according to your unfailing love, blot out my transgression. David sees his sin clearly. It's a terrible, ugly, nasty thing, and he hates it. And he says, have mercy on me, O God. Or think about Paul, right? Jump to the New Testament. Paul, there's a point, Romans chapter 7, he's so overcome by his, his own sin. He's so overwhelmed by the grief that his sin has, is causing him. This is what he says, verse 24. He says, what a wretched man I am. This is Paul saying this. He says, what a wretched man that I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? This is a guy that wrote like 30% of the New Testament. This is a guy who, who God has fundamentally changed every part of his life. Complete 180. And he says, what a wretched man that I am. See, see, here's what I want you to ask yourselves. And here's the question that I'm asking myself. Is that how those verses, those experiences, those examples, is that how we see our sin? Is that how you see your sin in your life? Is that how you respond to sin in your life? Have mercy on me, O oh God. What a wretched person I am. See, I hope, I'm praying you do. I, I pray for me that I do because that's what we need. But I also want you to hear this. I need to hear it too. The very next verse. The very next verse after Paul says, what a wretched man I am. This is what he says, verse 25. He says, thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Very next verse. What a wretched man I am. Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. You see, Paul's mourning, it turned to thankfulness. It turned to comfort. It turned to hope because it helped him see. It helped him recognize the beauty of God's grace, the beauty of God's love, the beauty of God's mercy, the beauty of God's forgiveness in contrast to what he actually deserved. That's what godly sorrow does. See, worldly sorrow, it feels bad about sin. It, it leads to regret. Paul says ultimately it leads to death because it blinds us to sin and it blinds us to its offensiveness to God. But godly sorrow, it does something different. It doesn't lead you to death. It leads you to life. It leads you to repentance, which leads to salvation. Life in Jesus. Music team, go ahead and come back. I, I know... That, that there are a lot of different things that we can talk about when we talk about sin. I know that I'm not scratching the surface when it comes to the effects of sin in the world. The ways that sin disrupts the world, the ways that sin disrupts our relationships, the ways that, that sin has fundamentally broken the human experience in every way. I, I get that I'm not talking about everything, but, but I want us to at least walk away wrestling with this one thing. What, what do you want? When you think about sin, what is it that you want? Do you, do you want to just keep feeling bad for sin? Do you want to just keep feeling bad about your sin? Do you want to just keep walking around with regret? I wish I hadn't done that. I wish I hadn't done that. I wish I wasn't doing that. Or do you want lasting change? Do you want lasting heart change, real change, real transformation, real Life. See, Jesus is blessed are those who mourn. Why? For they will be comforted. Comforted by, by what? By who? How? Jesus. Jesus, the one who doesn't just grieve over sin himself. He's the one who died and rose, what? To conquer it. He's coming back to right every wrong, to, to restore all things, to make everything sad come untrue. That's what Jesus is doing because of sin. And so because of that good news that Jesus came to proclaim, 
instead of just obsessing over your regrets, instead of just, just feeling bad about what other people think about you because of the choices that you're making, what if we heeded God's words? What if we listened to what Jesus is saying? What if we really took this verse tonight and this, be- this beatitude, what if we really took it to heart? What if we mourned over our sin, real mourning, real godly grief, real lament that we turn from it? Because we hate it. We run from sin. And better yet, we don't just run from sin. Better yet, we turn to Jesus. Turn to Jesus. Turn to Jesus because when you do, you'll find the forgiveness. You'll find the comfort. You'll find that Jesus is offering you. Amen.